Ember strings are fun. Ember strings are cool. Ember strings are what you study when there is nothing to do, and you decide that what you want to do is mathematics. Yeah. All right. Today is official inverse trick day. Let's start by defining inverse trig functions. So inverse trig functions are inverse functions to the trig functions. So we need to consider each trig function separately. So we're going to start with the sine function. So if you sketch the graph of a sine function, you get a nice oscillating function, which is clearly not one-to-one -one because it's periodic. So in fact, for any value of x, there'll be an infinite number of other x's that will have the same y value. So we can define the inverse function right away. But what we can do is restrict the domain so that the sine function becomes one-to-one -one over this restricted domain. We say that we define a principal branch for the sine function. And there's a conventional way of doing it for the sine function, which is to choose the principal branch to be between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So over this restricted domain, the function becomes one-to-one, -one, and we can define its inverse. And that's what it looks like. So the inverse sine function, the graph of the inverse sine function is obtained from the branch here by reflecting about the line y equals to y equals to x. The domain and the ranges are exchanged. And the statement of inverse functions is, as always, that y is equal to sine of x if and only if x is equal to the inverse sine of y for x in the domain or the principal branch for the sine function and y in the range of the sine function. Let's now look at the cosine function. So again, the cosine function is not one-to-one, -one, it's periodic, so we need to define its principal branch to be able to define the inverse cosine function. So the convention in this case is to choose the principal branch to be between 0 and pi, over which the function clearly is now one-to-one. -one. The range is still minus one-to-one, -one. and then the inverse cosine function looks like that. So this is again obtained by reflecting the branch about y equals to x, the main and ranges are exchanged, and the statement is that y equals cosine of x if and only if x is equal to inverse cosine of y for x in the principal branch and y in the range of the cosine function. We do the same thing for the tan function, which is also periodic, so not one-to-one. -one. We need to define its principal branch. The convention in this case is to choose the branch, principal branch to be between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Note here that uh, we do not include the endpoints because the tan function has vertical asymptotes, these endpoints, and in this case the range is not minus 1 to 1, the range of the tan function is uh, all real numbers. So the inverse tan function by reflecting about the y equals x-axis will look like that. The domain is now all real numbers, but the range is only between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. And one interesting thing to note here is that the vertical asymptotes are now mapped to horizontal asymptotes for the inverse function by reflection about the y equals x. The last three inverse trig functions are not used as much as the first three, but let me define them anyway. So the inverse cotan function is defined as follows. So we, by convention, choose the principal branch for the cotan function to be from 0 to pi, not including the endpoints again because the cotan function has vertical asymptotes. What's interesting to note again is that the vertical asymptotes at x equals to 0 and x equals to pi are mapped to horizontal asymptotes at y equals to 0 and y equals to pi for the inverse cotan function. And the domain of the inverse cotan function is all real numbers, while the range is only from 0 to pi. The inverse secant function and also the inverse cosecant functions are a little trickier to define. There is no universally accepted uh, convention for the choice of principal branch. So what I'll do is stick with the convention that's used in the textbook, and later on in this video I'll tell you why this is a good convention. But you have to be very careful if you use other resources, and also things like Wolfram Alpha and so on, they may use different choices of conventions for the principal branch for the inverse secant and inverse cosecant functions. So you have to be very careful with that. All right, so which choice do we make? So we'll take the principal branch to go from 0 to pi over 2, and then pi to 3 pi over 2. So over this interval, then the function is 1 to 1. Now you may think it would be more natural to go from 0 to pi over 2 and then pi over 2 to pi. That would be fine. That would be another choice of principal branch. But uh, we'll stick with this one because I'll explain later that this gives a nice result for derivatives of inverse trig functions. All right, so this is the choice of domain. And then the range here, well, you see, is basically all negative numbers all the way to minus 1 and all positive numbers uh, greater or equal than 1. So the inverse secant function will look like that. Vertical asymptotes becomes horizontal asymptotes. 
the domain now is all negative numbers less or equal than minus 1 and all positive numbers greater or equal than 1 and the range becomes from uh, 0 to pi over 2 and pi to 3 pi over 2. And finally, the inverse cosecant function. That's another one that has no universally accepted convention for the principal branch, so we'll stick with the choice in the textbook, which is to go from 0 to pi over 2. But then instead of keeping going all the way to pi, we skip and go from pi to 3 pi over 2. Again, that doesn't seem very natural here, but this is a natural choice from the point of view of derivatives of inverse trig functions. The range is just like for the secant function, so the inverse cosecant function looks like that. Again, vertical asymptotes becomes horizontal asymptotes, and domains and ranges are exchanged. All right, so we know what inverse trig functions are. Let me now make two important comments. First is just a notation. So I've used a notation inverse sine of x, inverse cos of x, and so on. There's another notation which is used, which is to call these inverse function arc sine of x, arc cos of x, and so on. So the, the, both notations mean the same thing. Arc sine just means the inverse sine function. So both notations are used in the textbook and they're used in, in general. So we're going to use both as well in this course. And the other remark I want to make is that you have to be very careful. Make sure that you know that inverse sine function of x is not the same thing as the reciprocal of the sine function. That's not at all the same thing. This is just 1 over sine. This is the inverse function. So these are totally different. So that's why uh, pretty often, uh, personally, I prefer using the arc sine notation, which makes it clear that we're talking about the inverse sine function or inverse trig functions in general. But since the textbook is using this uh, minus 1 notation quite a bit, we're going to use it as well in this class. Before we talk about derivatives of inverse trig functions, let me now work through two examples where we are asked to evaluate the value of an inverse trig function. So in the first example, I'm asking you to calculate the inverse sine of square root of 3 over 2. To determine what this is, you really need to understand carefully what the definition of inverse trig functions are. So what is this asking you? Well, let's call that theta. What this is asking you is, what is the angle theta, which is such that the sine of theta will be equal to square root of 3 over 2, and also that theta is in the principal branch of the sine function, because this is what we use to define the inverse sine function. All right, so this is just a statement that the inverse sine is an inverse function to the sine function with this choice of principal branch. But now we can certainly figure this out, right? We could, for example, draw our favorite trig circle. All right, so we're looking for an, uh, for an angle between minus pi over 2, pi over 2, so it's going to be in this region of the circle, and we're looking for an angle such that uh, the sine is equal to square root 3 over 2. Well, if you remember trigonometry, then you'll know that this angle is exactly pi over 3. So in other words, this is the only angle in this region of the circle which is such that the sine is equal to square root of 3 over 2. So that would be the answer to the question in this case. Okay, so let me do a second example. Suppose that I'm asking you to calculate the inverse secant of minus 2. Well, if I call that theta, what this is asking is what is the angle theta such that secant of theta is equal to minus 2, and theta lies in the principal branch that we use to define the inverse secant function. That was one of the two complicated cases, so we chose between 0 and pi over 2, and then pi and 3 pi over 2. All right, but before we look at the trig circle, it might be actually easier to deal with cosine instead of secant. So remember, secant is 1 over cosine, so if we want secant of theta to be equal to minus 2, we want, this is the same statement as saying that we want 1 over cosine of theta to be equal to minus 2, which implies that we're looking for an angle theta such that its cosine is equal to minus 1 half. Okay, and now we can look at the trig circle. Now what region of the trig, circles, uh, trig circle are we interested in? So we want between 0 and pi over 2, that's here, and then pi and 3 pi over 2, so that's here. And we're looking for an angle in one of these two regions, which is such that the cosine is minus 1 over 2. Well, first, because the cosine is negative, we know we're going to be in this region here, because otherwise the cosine would be positive. And again, if you remember from your trigonometry, uh, the angle here that will be such that the cosine is minus 1 half is, and the angle that is in this region will be 4 pi over 3. 
which would be the answer to this question. All right, so let's now calculate derivatives of inverse trig functions. I'm only going to calculate here the derivative of the inverse cosine function, but the other ones can be calculated along similar lines. Okay, so let's start with the inverse cosine function. What is this? Well, this was defined as being the inverse function to the cosine function, and also I had to restrict the domain in the range of the cosine function, so the domain of the cosine function, which becomes the range and the inverse cosine, was taken to be in the principal branch from 0 to pi, and the range of the cosine function, which is the domain of the inverse cosine, is between minus 1 and 1. Okay, so how do I calculate the derivative? Well, the idea here will be to start with this expression here and use implicit differentiation, just like we did for logarithms. So let's see how this goes. So what is implicit differentiation? I calculate the derivative on both sides with respect to x. But then, of course, I remember that y is, is itself a function of x. So on the left-hand side, I need to use the chain rule. So I get minus sine of y times y prime, and just 1 on the right-hand side, which tells me that y prime is equal to minus 1 over sine of y. Now, I could substitute back in here y being equal to the inverse cosine of x. That would give me, would give me minus 1 over sine of inverse cosine of x. That would be fine, but it's a pretty ugly answer. There is, in fact, a much better way of rewriting this answer. All right, so let's see how this goes. I'm going to show you in two different ways how you can rewrite this expression as a function of x. But before we do that, let me notice something that will be quite important for us. So we are restricting y to be between to be between 0 and pi. What does that imply for sine of y? Well, if you remember what the sine function looks like, so the graph of the sine function is something like this, and between 0 and pi here, the sine function is positive. So y being restricted to be between 0 and pi implies that the sine of y will always be greater or equal to 0. All right, so let's see now how we can rewrite sine of y as a function of x. So the first approach will be to use trig identities. So what do I mean by that? So one trig identity that we know very well is that sine square of y plus cosine square of y is equal to 1. Okay, so I can solve that for sine square of y. I'll get that sine square of y is equal to 1 minus cosine square of y. And now I can actually take the square root because I know that sine of y will be always positive. So I know that I should take the positive square root. So I can rewrite sine of y as being the square root, the positive square root, of 1 minus cosine square of y. All right, so I've rewritten sine of y as a function of cosine of y. Now, why is it useful? Well, remember that y is itself the inverse cosine function of x. So what we know here is that cosine of y is actually cosine of inverse cosine of x. And then x is, of course, taken to be in the domain of the inverse cosine function. So this is just applying the inverse function and then the function itself. So I go back to x. So in other words, what I've just calculated is that sine of y can be rewritten as the square root of 1 minus x squared. And plugging this back into my formula for y prime, I deduce that the derivative of the inverse cosine function, which is just y prime, will be equal to minus 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. This is pretty cool, right? There's no trig function or anything like that anymore. This is just a simple function of x. All right, so let me now show you a different way of doing the same calculation. So my second approach will use Pythagorean theorem. What do I mean by that? All right, so what do we know? Well, we know that by definition of the inverse function here, cosine of y is equal to x. Okay, so I can draw a nice right triangle here, and then I can try to interpret geometrically what this statement means. So if I set y as being the angle here, then the cosine, which is the length of this side over the length of this side, should be x. So I could say that the length of this side is x, and this one is 1. All right, and then by Pythagorean theorem, I know that the length of this side will be equal to 1 square root of 1 minus x squared. And then I deduce right away that the sine of y, 
which is the length of this side over the length of this side, will be equal to square root of 1 minus x square, which is exactly what I need. So I can plug this back in my formula for y prime, end up with the same statement as before, namely that the derivative of the inverse cosine function will be equal to minus 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. All right, so this is pretty cool. The two approaches are fine. You can use the one that you prefer. Now, you may uh, think that the Pythagorean approach is actually faster. That's true. But one thing that is important to note here is that it only worked because y was, rest was restricted to be between 0 and pi, so sine of y was positive, which is exactly what we got here. But either way is fine, you can use uh, the approach that you prefer. All right, so you can calculate derivatives of other inverse trig functions in a very similar way, and here's the result. So there's a few things to note about uh, these derivatives. First, none of them involve trig or inverse trig functions, which is kind of cool. And also you can see that the second column here differs from the first column only by minus signs. And one thing also which is quite interesting is that our choice of principal branch for, for uh, the definition of the inverse secant and inverse cosecant function is such that we get these nice derivatives. So as I discussed uh, when we define these functions, there's another common choice of principal branch for these functions. Uh, it looks more natural from the definition of the function, but it would result in the derivatives here having absolute values, which is not so nice. So our choice can be justified as being such that we get nice-looking derivatives. All right, so if you're wondering now whether you should know these derivatives by heart, uh, my advice is, well, you don't have to. If you can, that's great, but you don't really have to. Uh, you should, however, know that they exist, what they look like, and you should be able to derive them just as we did uh, in the previous slide.